1660, the long dark night of the Cromwellian era came to an end at last. An Englishman heaved a sigh of relief as they raised their glasses loyally toasting the new king or danced round their maypoles or threw flowers at him as he rode in his progress on his way from Dover. They were glad to look back on everything that had happened before and to look forward to the future with hopeful expectation. And they were not to be disappointed. For in Charles II they had found a remarkable new king. He was just 30 on the day he entered London. And during his long years of exile, he had become greatly influenced by the French and Dutch styles of the homes in which he had to live. Charles was a man who loved to embrace new enthusiasms, but he was no dilettante king. He was determined to see that things were done properly. And now he decided that English classic architecture, already established and thriving under his father, should be surrounded by suitable gardens. Less than a year after his return, Edmund Waller had written a poem entitled On St. James's Park, as lately improved by His Majesty. And soon Charles was to make a further contribution to the new national self-confidence by developing the splendid gardens of the palace at Hampton Court. <laughs> Charles commissioned his French gardener, André Mollet, to transform the royal gardens. Here at Hampton Court, Mollet began by having the huge ornamental waterway, a canal, dug and filled from the Thames. It was his desire to emulate the grandeur of Louis XIV's court in France that led Charles to copy some of the visible signs of that grandeur. Charles had plainly been influenced by the huge formal French gardens like this one at vaux le vicomte It was designed by the most famous of all French garden designers, André Lenotre. When Mollet died, he was succeeded by John Rose, seen here presenting a pineapple to his king. Though Rose was English, he had trained in France under Le Nôtre and had brought back French ideas which he adapted to suit English gardens. Other men too were impressed by the French gardens. Even before the Civil War, Edmund Waller had begun his garden at Hall Barn near Beaconsfield. He had travelled to France with his friend the diarist John Evelyn and his garden reflects those French visits, though admittedly on a more modest scale. Holborn still exists, the earliest example of the French style in England with its walls of trees and hedges. In 1664, Evelyn published a book called Silver. This was a discourse on forest trees and it remained the standard work on trees for over a century. Among other things, Evelyn championed the planting of yew in the garden. At Levens, the famous yew topiary and tunnels of beech were laid out by another French gardener, but the result is certainly not a French garden. Charles II and a few men like Evelyn and Waller were decidedly in advance of their time in adopting French ideas. As at Levens, no one style seemed to predominate. Ideas were borrowed indiscriminately from Italy, France and Holland. These paintings of contemporary gardens demonstrate this mixture of styles.
all show typical walled gardens surrounding the house, divided by further walls into compartments. Vegetable gardens, flower gardens, and enclosures with lawns. Even when the Dutchman William III became king, this mixture of styles persisted. In Holland, the royal palace at Het Loo had been designed by Daniel Marrow on a grand scale. Marrow was yet another pupil of André de Nôtre. When William arrived in England, he brought Marrow over and promptly set him to work. His first commission here at Hampton Court. Here, Marrow designed the huge formal layout with its elaborate arrangement of beds. The canal was left untouched. But it was neither Holland nor France which inspired this garden at Paris Castle. The Italians had made terraced gardens on their hills. To build his garden, Lord Rockford settled for the same device, the terrace. Great terraces used to lead down to a formal garden here in the foreground, but this has long since disappeared. The terraces themselves, planted today with modern shrubs, but still with their original statues and balustrades, reflect the original Italian inspiration. Gardens of townhouses, probably because they were smaller and enclosed, did show a clear Dutch influence. The intricate flower beds, punctuated with innumerable clipped evergreens, and the flower-filled urns lining the terrace walls are typically Dutch. The gardens of Dirham near Bath were laid out for King William's Secretary for War, William Blathwaite. It was he, on one of his frequent visits to Holland, who brought over the great pottery urns from Delft and the tulips to fill them. The Dutch, then as now, were foremost in the propagation of bulbs, especially the more exotic forms of striped tulip. Delft vases, with their many spouts, were specially designed to display the new varieties of tulips inside the house itself. In an age of increasing prosperity, people wanted to cultivate plants which were as rare as the rarest tulip, but more difficult to grow. To guard these specimens from the weather, they constructed special buildings, and inside they grew plants and flowers then considered highly exotic. The Peruvian sunflower, and the hyacinths from the Near East are common today. In 1705, when these pictures were painted for the Duchess of Beaufort, they were newly arrived imports from the furthest corners of the earth. Oranges, from which the orangery gets its name, were grown probably for decoration. And the pineapple too was admired for its exotic appearance rather than its taste. <laughs> the oranges themselves would be kept inside during the winter and in the summer they would be brought outside and arranged in their tubs along terraces and paths. <laughs> 
These needlework tapestries were sewn by the ladies at Stoke Edith House in the early 1700s and give a unique record of a typical garden of that period. Even if many of the tulips and clipped evergreens came from Holland, the fruit trees espaliered on the walls were cultivated in England. The most famous nursery garden in England was founded in 1681 by George London, who was joined later by Henry Wise. London and Wise were more than mere nurserymen. They were gardeners to both King William and Queen Anne, and laid out the gardens at Kensington Palace. Their famous nursery, situated conveniently nearby on the site of what is now the Victoria and Albert Museum, could offer 72 varieties of pear trees alone. For gardens all over England, like Chatsworth and Longleat, hundreds of thousands of trees would be provided by London and Wise and planted to their designs. The planting, even on this massive scale, was probably completed in only a few months, but the maturing of the trees took decades. London and Wise's designs for the ground close to the house were real patterns for pleasure, and they were called parterres. Parterres were a development of the knot garden, greatly enlarged and elaborated, but using many of the same materials. Clipped evergreens, coloured earths, sand and grass were the principal ingredients. They were designed to be looked down on and enjoyed, and not just from raised terraces, the state apartments in many houses were on the first floor. If London and Wise borrowed the designs for the parterres from the French, they set them within the framework of English walls, and the overall design was seldom planned in the perfectly symmetrical French manner. In 1712, when John James translated the theory and practice of gardening from the French original, he illustrated the book not only with general layouts, which are rigidly symmetrical, but also with designs for parterres, showing details like the pâte d'oie, a pattern of radiating alleys in the shape of a goose's foot. These paintings of Hartwell show the goose's foot as well as trees and hedges clipped in a variety of elaborate ways. In addition, they show how those who had the leisure to use the garden used it and how those who were obliged to maintain the garden maintained it. The English walls of brick and stone were replaced with the green walls of hedges and pleached trees. Pleaching is the practice of turning a row of hornbeam or lime trees into a hedge on stilts. At Inkpen, the pleached alley is of limes, the hedges are of yew and beech. Behind the hedges, the taller beech trees would have been plashed, trimmed to form a second much higher wall of green. The garden at Inkpen is the only remaining example of a small garden in the French manner. The other formal gardens have disappeared. Changes in fashion and ravages of weather have left Inkpen unique. One example of a large garden still exists at St. Paul's Waldenbury. <laughs> 
The layout at St. Paul's Waldenbury is not only larger than ink pen, it is much more elaborate. Here are the alleys of the Goosefoot, crossed by further alleys forming a trellised pattern of walks, lead to temples and statues. The use of statuary and buildings to draw the eye into the distance has the effect of exaggerating the size of the garden, and they were also used here to decorate the glades that lie between the alleys. On a really large estate like Dunham Massey near Manchester, the alleys and the garden develop into enormous avenues in a forest of trees. John James, in his theory and practice of gardening, says, the forest consists of great trees, very high, with ridings cut for hunting through them. No hedges, no gravel. They should be planted in a star with a large circle where the ridings meet. Dunham Massey certainly did look like this but we are not sure that the plan of badminton was achieved in quite such complexity. A few miles away, one really long ride still exists. In 1715, Lord Bathurst started work on a ride from his townhouse in Sirencester to his country house, and the connecting ride is five miles long. There were two distinct and practical reasons why Lord Bathurst wooded his park and planted his great ride. Firstly, trees were a profitable investment. Secondly, the ride itself, as he said, helped him to get away from the summer smells of the town. From 1700 onwards, an ever-increasing number of Acts of Parliament were passed, allowing the landowners to increase their acreage by enclosing the old common land. This enclosure movement lasted right through the 18th century. And this painting of the countryside near Cheltenham shows a vast unfenced area of common land with over a hundred people harvesting the hay. In the companion painting, the land has been enclosed into small fields. Dixton Manor was obviously a small and modest establishment, but there was nothing to stop a richer landlord from extending his park or garden over as many of his fields as he liked. And certainly many of them did so because enclosing the land meant more efficient farming and greater efficiency yielded more food and bigger profits. Improved methods of farming and gardening required good implements. 
These gardening tools have hardly changed in 250 years. They are carved in stone on the base of an obelisk which marks the completion of the garden at Hall Barn and the end of the French influence on English gardening. It was erected in 1730, some 80 years after the first tree was planted. Until 1720, John Aislaby had lived at Hall Barn. Aislaby was a former Chancellor of the Exchequer who had been imprisoned in the Tower for corruption. And on his release, he retired to his estate in Yorkshire, where he created the first Holy English Garden. Half a mile from the house, the river Skell passes through a steep banked valley and opens out into a semicircle of wooded hills. Aislaby dammed the river and with a considerable feat of hydraulics turned it into a canal and from this fed the moon ponds. The canal and the ponds are arranged in a formal pattern, but the simplicity of grass and water set within the natural amphitheatre of trees makes Studley Royal one of the finest of all English gardens. Five years after the restoration, the English garden began to reflect the solid growing wealth of the nation. As times became more prosperous, the garden became less defensive, less dependent on being protected by castle moats and walls. Rides, avenues and patterns of water belonged to the formal garden. Now there was to be a new and simple device which was to change the character not only of the garden but of the whole landscape. 